Hi everyone, welcome to another video of Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. Today's topic is the use of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure in mitral stenosis. This is a follow-up video to the introductory video that I did a little while back on pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or wedge pressure tracings. So please do check that video out if you want to get the concepts clear before coming to this video wherein we'll be solely talking about how PCWP tracings are used to diagnose mitral stenosis in the cardiac cath lab. Let's mind map today's topic. So we are going to be talking about pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which falls under the broad topic of hemodynamics. And we're going to take a small subset of it called PCWP in mitral stenosis. There are around six questions for today. So I'd like you to go through these questions, see if any of them seem familiar, try and attempt to answer them. And if not, just go ahead with this video and then come back to these questions to revise the entire video. So describe A and V waves in mitral stenosis. Just a little reminder that the wedge pressure tracing overall consists of A, X, V, and Y waves. And out of all these waves, the V wave is greater than the A wave, which reflects the decreased overall compliance of LA with respect to the RA. Now, what happens in mitral stenosis? In mitral stenosis, which is early, the LA A waves are large. That means the LA is going to start enlarging in response to the obstruction to inflow because of mitral stenosis. And as the left atrium distends, the A wave, that is the atrial kick or the atrial contraction, is going to be dominant. However, when a person has a long standing severe mitral stenosis, then large V waves develop. And what does the development of V waves mean? It means that LA contractile dysfunction has set in. As a result, the A waves diminish in size and the V waves start increasing in size. Essentially, large V waves correlate with exercise intolerance and severity of pH in mitral stenosis. Now, this is a question about the left ventricular pressure tracing, which I have not talked about yet so far in my videos, but this is important in terms of what happens to the left ventricle in mitral stenosis. So the question here is, what happens to LVA wave and left ventricular end diastolic pressure, that is LVDP, in severe mitral stenosis? Well, essentially what happens is, because of mitral stenosis, there is left ventricular inflow obstruction, and as a result, the left ventricle is underfilled. So the A wave, which is seen in the left ventricular pressure tracing, is small and the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is not risen. In fact, it is reduced. So let's see an example of this so that you will know how these two pressure tracings get superimposed to, or to finally form a tracing, which is what we're going to be studying subsequently. So this is the left ventricular pressure tracing and this is the wedge pressure tracing. I'd like to remind you to kindly go over the wedge pressure tracing video so that you'll have a better idea about the concepts of this trace. Now, in left ventricular pressure tracing, we can see that there are two main phases, obviously the systole and the diastole. So this is the left ventricular systole and this is the diastolic phase. Now, in certain areas, you can see that there is an A wave which gets inscribed on the late diastolic phase of the left ventricular pressure tracing. So this is what they mean uh, when they ask you a question about the left ventricular A wave. So that means when the left atrium is contracting during the late diastole, some of it goes and gets inscribed onto the left ventricular diastolic pressure tracing as well. When the A wave in the left ventricular diastolic pressure tracing is increased, that means we know that the left ventricular compliance is decreased and the left atrium is trying to contract vigorously. But in mitral stenosis, opposite events are happening because of the shear inflow obstruction and as a result, the A wave is obviously going to be small. So this is what it means. What is LVDP? LVDP is the pressure that you get after the A wave. Now, this usually again rises when the left ventricular compliance is decreased. But again, in severe mitral stenosis, 
it is not the case because the LV is underfilled. As a result, the LVDP is again reduced. It is not going to be risen. Now, when you try to superimpose the wedge pressure tracing with the LV, this is what you get. Now, these are the waves of the wedge pressure tracing. This is the V wave, which is usually predominant. And this is the A wave. This is a normal wedge pressure tracing. And V wave, along with its X wave, like for example, over here, you have the X descent and the early part of V wave are both systolic events. And the Y descent and the A wave are diastolic events. So this is how you see the timing. So when they both are superimposed, this is what you get. You get the dip, that is this downstroke of the left ventricular pressure tracing here. And then this is the upstroke of the left pressure tracing, which is over here. So this is what we are getting in LV pressure tracing. And superimposed upon it, you have the wedge pressure tracing, which is here, where the V wave and the A wave are present. Now, one thing which is important is that usually when we take a left atrial pressure tracing, the V wave corresponds exactly to the downstroke of the left ventricular pressure tracing. This is the timing. This is the timing that, that is ideal and this is what you would expect. So now that we've understood how the superimposed waves of the left ventricular and the wedge pressure tracings look, the next question is obviously, how do you describe the diastolic gradient when there is mitral stenosis? So now remember, normally there is no gradient between these two pressure tracings. That means this wedge pressure tracing would be much lower and almost correspond with this diastolic phase of the left ventricular pressure tracing. Now, when you have mitral stenosis, you will get a gap between the two pressure tracings and this is all in diastole. So anything before this is the systole and after this is the systole. This is the downstroke of the LV pressure tracing. This is the diastolic phase and this is the upstroke of the LV pressure tracing which enters the systole. So the LA and LV pressure gradient. Now here we are talking about LA because LA is the most perfect way to measure a gradient in mitral stenosis. Of course, we may not be able to get an LA pressure tracing always because we would have to puncture the interatrial septum in order to reach the left atrium. But ideally, if we assume this to be an LA pressure tracing instead of a wedge pressure tracing, then the LA and LV pressure gradient is highest in diastole and it decreases thereafter. So here we get a higher gradient in the early part of diastole and it starts decreasing later on because, because of the obstruction in mitral stenosis, even though it attempts to decrease, it still is not equalizing because this gradient is fixed. So this is what the second point talks about. When there is severe mitral stenosis, the diastolic gradient does not equalize. That is, this LA pressure tracing does not come close to the LV pressure tracing, which in effect means that diastasis is not reached. In normal people who do not have mitral stenosis, diastasis is reached in mid-diastole. In certain patients who do not have severe mitral stenosis, who have mild or moderate mitral stenosis and with a very slow heart rate, and when you say slow heart rate, that means you are giving enough time for diastolic events to occur, then diastasis may sometimes be reached at the very end because you are giving sheer time for the events to equalize. In the last example, we talked about the LV and the LA pressure tracings and how they look in mitral stenosis. So now we're going to be talking about an important question that is comment about how the wedge pressure tracing is different with respect to the LA pressure tracing. So as I said, a wedge pressure tracing is much, much easier to obtain as compared to a left atrial pressure tracing. So clinically, we usually use the wedge pressure tracing more often. The answer is that the wedge pressure tracing is delayed by 50 to 150 milliseconds with respect to the left atrial pressure tracing. The wedge pressure is also more damped than the left atrial pressure. It is less deep and it is less steep in terms of its Y descent. So let's look here so that we'll get an, get an idea in terms of a diagram. This is an ideal left atrial pressure tracing 
in those patients who do not really have a mitral stenosis or a mitral a typical severe mitral stenotic gradient so here you can see that it is left atrial pressure tracing and this is the left ventricular pressure tracing you can see that the v wave of the left atrial pressure tracing is getting bisected by this down stroke of the left ventricular pressure tracing and this is a very important point and here you can see that there is a gradient initially because the v wave is large due to whatever reason but then diastasis is reached immediately after the early part of diastole more importantly this y descent is steep and it is deep this is what is seen in a proper la pressure tracing now if you take a wedge pressure tracing you will see that there is delay in the peak of the v wave and we've said that it delays by almost 50 to 150 milliseconds so the peak is much later than the downstroke of the lv pressure tracing so you get this this green part which is showing a falsely high gradient so what do you do to correct this gradient so this correction of phase delay is achieved by shifting the wedge pressure tracing leftward so that the peak of the v wave is intersected by the left ventricular downstroke and this is what happens here this v wave is shifted or the uh, pre wedge pressure tracing is shifted to the left and this is how the v wave gets bisected by the downstroke so you see that the gradient now or the area under the curve now is much lesser than what we got in this example so this is the problem we get when we use a wedge pressure tracing because you may overestimate a gradient that is the transmitral gradient in cases of mitral stenosis and it has been said that overestimation of the gradient occurs by almost 1.7 millimeters of mercury so one of the ways in which you can lessen this phase delay is by using large end hole catheters of 8 french which will essentially minimize the amount of damping of the v wave we've already talked about this however i would like to reiterate this again the question is how to differentiate the diastolic gradient of mitral regurgitation from that of mitral stenosis so essentially when mitral regurgitation is large there is a lot of volume which goes in the left atrium during systole and to a, during the subsequent diastole that amount of volume returns back to the lv so it gives rise to a certain amount of pressure gradient from the la to the lv and it may seem to be a gradient which simulates a mitral stenotic gradient so we need to differentiate both on pressure tracing so that we do not think that one stands for the other so what happens in mitral regurgitation that is significant mitral mitral regurgitation there is elevated left atrial pressure the v wave is ample so it is a large v wave there is a sharp down slope of the v wave and this is in opposition to a slow down slope in mitral stenosis why is that because of the fixed inflow stenosis it doesn't allow the pressures of the la and lv to equalize and hence the v wave continues going on and on throughout the diastole the v wave pressure does not fall down sharply as what happens in mitral regurgitation so sharp down slope in v of of v wave in 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 cases of mr and a slow down slope in cases of significant ms and also the mitral regurgitation uh, la pressures will have a early diastolic pressure however towards the end diastasis will be achieved so la and lv pressures equalize in mid diastole that is diastasis is achieved but it does not happen in mitral stenosis at all unless it's a less severe mitral stenosis so no end la lv end diastolic gradient in seen is seen in mitral regurgitation which means that diastasis is achieved towards the end of the diastole however in mitral stenosis an end diastolic gradient is seen as well so all these points are covered with these two diagrams just see this is an example of mr and this is an example of significant ms both will have elevated la pressures they've taken an la pressure tracing instead of a wedge pressure tracing because it is more perfect and here you can see that the v wave is quite ample in mr and it has a very sharp down slope whereas the v wave in mitral stenosis is very very slow 
the uh, diastolic pressure gradient is highest in the early part of diastole in MR, whereas it is present throughout in mitral stenosis. Diastasis is achieved, that is, both LA and LV pressures are equalized after the early phase of diastole in MR, whereas this does not happen in significant mitral stenosis. There is no gradient at the end of diastole in MR, whereas there is a significant gradient even at the end of diastole in mitral stenosis. This is a repetition of what we've already studied. How does a large V wave affect the interpretation of MS gradient? And we've already understood the concepts of recognizing which V wave belongs to MS and which does not. But largely, causes of large V waves is mitral stenosis, which is significant, severe mitral regurgitation, and a decompensated LV failure. When the LV failure is compensated, that, that time A wave is greater than the V wave. However, when it starts becoming decompensated, that, that means the left atrial compliance decreases and the V wave starts increasing. So when you take a wedge pressure and a LV simultaneous recording, it sometimes overestimates the true transmitral gradient by almost 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury, and that is quite a lot. So here is an example. This is an LV pressure tracing. There is a significant early dip here, and this is an A wave. The same thing here. This is the downstroke, and this is the upstroke of the LV. And here you have a wedge pressure tracing, which is what we usually take in our clinical practice. We can't always take the LA pressure tracing. Now, when you have a large V wave, suppose in this patient, the V wave is large because of any reason. It could be because of mitral stenosis, or there is a superimposed amount of MR also. And we are trying to uh, we are trying to calculate the amount of transmitral gradient. So here what we get, this green part, is a pretty significant transmitral gradient. That means essentially this gradient is getting overestimated because of this wedge pressure. One of the clues that could tell you that the mitral stenosis is not very significant is that if diastasis is achieved at the end of diastole, that means the mitral stenosis is not that significant. So that is useful. So there are only two things that you can do in order to make sure that whatever gradient you're getting is as close to reality as possible. Number one, shift the V wave leftward, which we've already done here. And here it is getting bisected by the downstroke of the LV. That is the most important thing that can be done in the cat lab. It is a post-processing procedure that you can do on these tr pressure tracings when you are analyzing them. However, sometimes there is still a discrepancy and you're not sure because clinically you're getting one finding, the echo showing another finding, and the cat tracings are still not giving the true picture. That is when you have to go for a direct LA pressure measurement. And surprisingly, this is what can be obtained. Here you're getting an LA pressure where there is only an early gradient and it is trying to achieve diastasis towards the end. That means the true mitral gradient or the transmitral gradient is actually not that significant and that a large V wave is in fact just contributing to the early part of a greater diastolic gradient. So in conclusion, can a delayed timing botch up the diagnosis badly? Oh yes, it can. So the takeaway message from this video is that always remember to shift the wedge pressure tracing to the left so that the V wave gets intersected by the downstroke of the LV pressure tracing. So like, share, subscribe, comment, and press the bell icon. And I'll see you next time with another video. Bye-bye.